Welcome everybody once again to Ringsiders Wrestling. Today we're joined by a special guest, somebody I'm sure you're all familiar with. He's wrestled for Ring of Honor, WWE. You've probably seen him recently in NXT and more recently Ring of Honor once again. We're joined today by Tyler Rust. Tyler, thank you for joining us. Hey, brother. No, you got to watch Tyler part. Got to be Taylor. Oh, yeah, Taylor. It is, it's Taylor, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask uh, which one do you prefer going by? <laughs> so I know you've got wide both. We don't want to get sued now. You don't want to get sued. No, that is a very good point. And neither do we. So <laughs> mm. <laughs> I can always deal about the lawsuits. Um, mm. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Um, How is it going with you? I mean, I know it's been a couple of busy months for you. Uh, lots changed, but how's it been for you immediately since your release from WWE? Uh, it's been really good, honestly, be- mostly because of uh, Ring of Honor. Yeah. You know, as soon as I got released, Ring of Honor was right there. They were uh, immediately op- accepting me back with open arms. You know, I t- talked to them maybe uh, about, about a day or two after everything happened. Right. And they were like, you know, hey, don't worry about it. Like, we're totally here for you. Uh, we can talk you know, contract negotiations, you know, in the early part of 2022. So it was no issue. Um, the news of Ring of Honor, obviously not having a certain future anymore, yeah. has changed a lot of the wind in my sails. And we'll see kind of how, you know, the year 2022 goes for me now, I guess. Uh, hopefully it's not the end of Ring of Honor, but if it is, then no, this last show at Final Battle will Definitely be a good one, at least. Yeah. I, I, we were talking to uh, Kerry Silkin the other day, um, and he was saying the future is very unsure at the moment. I think I speak yeah. when I say we'd, we'd rather it come back stronger than ever, but that's uncertain right now. If it is the end of an era at Final Battle, I'm sure it's going to be a great end of an era. Like, everybody's going to deliver on that card. Everyone's going to do what they can to make it memorable. Um, hopefully Ring of Honor does come back in 2022 stronger than ever. Uh, but un- until then, I mean, have you put out the feelers for anywhere else? Is there anywhere, any, of, any other companies that are taking your interest right now? Uh, I mean, as long as I'm still wrestling, I'm, you know, interested in going wherever wrestling is good. And by that, I mean, like the actual, uh, you know, like, like Matt Wrestling. Because, you know, Matt Wrestling, the storytelling for it, it's not accepted everywhere. And I think places I found where it really was, was like over in uh, Germany, for example, with WXW, when I was touring with them, they absolutely love that style over there. And it was a place that I found a real home for a while. Um, going forward here, I'll probably be doing a lot with New Japan and New Japan Strong. So that would probably be the start of 2022. It would be me working a good relationship with them. And we'll see where it goes from there. Well, it's yeah. funny you should mention Germany because before we uh, came on on the air, we were speaking to I was speaking to Rian, and he actually said that uh, he saw you in Germany at WXW. Oh, and uh, he's a big fan of your work from that uh, from that appearance. So, yeah, um, my last show before the pandemic, I flew over to Germany. Um, probably shouldn't have been in retrospect but um it was uh it was 16 karat gold and you're in the ambition term i know you've done oh. you, you, you've done ambition before but um i two names that i came out of that thing out of just the whole wxw experience because i went for the full weekend was daniel Maccabe and yourself because that style really just like kind of what do you think about like the, the crowd says nothing it's all very silent and um, i saw like ridgeway win with a head kick to the head and then you have an some amazing matches it's just it seems like it's you you really enjoy it as well you can see that you like really really enjoy it and you got a smile on your face doing it so just wanted it wanted you to like touch on ambition and kind of shoot style wrestling and maybe how, oh, how, you're, how are you going to take that forward as well ambition was a it's a really really special tournament that they do right because it's treated very differently even by the fans like um they treat it with a lot of respect when they go and watch it. That's why it's a much more silent atmosphere, not because they're bored, but they're very intent in what they're seeing. And it's very appreciative of all the work that's going on. And usually the guys are all in there. Uh, Mike Bailey is a terrific one as well. You know, every time he's in the ambition tournaments, he puts on these incredible, more realistic shoot style matches because he has an incredible background. You know, it was martial arts. Um, the match I had, I remember it was me and Tyson Dukes in the, uh, mm that little tournament there you were at that match like we never wrestled before but we had a really really awesome 
like 10, 12 minutes, you know, just straight catch wrestling, yeah. uh, a little intensity so it was building up. So him and Ridgeway were my opponents in that tournament, I believe. And yeah, that second head kick Ridgeway gave me, man, he can throw his kicks pretty good, you know what I mean? Like uh, he was right in there in the pocket. But uh, great stuff. I love those tournaments. Uh, Macabre is a great guy. I met through those things as well. And he did really well in those ones. I think he actually won that last tournament. Yeah, he 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 won with an Irish jersey on, so I was very happy. Yeah, with that. and That's they right, also he did. and I also had a Daisuke Okada in Ishikawa. I don't know if you caught that match, but that was probably oh, one of man. the scariest matches I've ever watched. I was actually sitting with uh, Tim Thatcher, and we were watching that match together up on the rafters. And they're just doing like the the headbutts back and oh. forth, right? And I'm just like, dang man, like. <laughs> Afterwards, I had asked, you know, uh, Ikeda, like, hey, you know, Itai, you know, does it hurt? And he was just like, uh, every time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you two were both much older than me and more badass than I'll ever be. So, you know, thank you for being here. It's one of those things, isn't it? When you see wrestlers headbutting each other so much, you think, well, if they're doing it that often, it can't hurt as much as you think it does. But then when you hear that it does every time, that's that's worrying. Like, <laughs> it makes me flinch even thinking about it. I can't even imagine what it's like <laughs> to get headbutted by some of these guys. I think it would probably kill a normal man. Um, so who, who's the ha- what's the hardest you've ever been struck? Who's the hardest striker? I know Ridgeway is a hard striker. Uh, but he's hard as fuck, isn't he? That's, yeah, that's, hardest, that's <laughs> who's, who's the hardest striker you've ever been in there with? Uh, it would be a guy that nobody really knows his name unless they were like followers of the independent wrestling scene before it kind of got big. Hmm. His name was the uh, suicide kid, Mikey Henderson. Right. So I was uh, like, I was like 19. And this guy must have been in his late 20s at that point. And he was kind of, you know, devil wrestling almost. But uh, we were from the same area, and so he liked me, and he wanted to work with me. And he was like an early, you know, young protege, little prospect on, like, the independent scene, I want to say around, like, the year 2001, 2002 kind of time. Um, he was this, you know, short, really thick, stocky guy. Great little worker, great intensity. Uh, and this guy, man, he just, that guy beat the living shit out of me in that match. <laughs> and it wasn't just because I was like 19. No, I was just getting used to know that guy. I've heard from other people. They've all said, oh, yeah, uh, Mikey Henderson, the suicide kid, is probably the stiffest guy I've ever had to work. Wow. So, like the, hard, the hardest hitter. I'm not stiffest, the hardest hitter. I love that. The fact that you've been in the ring with some really hard strikers, but the one that's the hardest striker is somebody that most people won't be familiar with. And I, I, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be Googling them later anyway. Yeah, that's, I'll be, I yeah. want to do some of his strikes. <laughs> <laughs> He's a ball of intensity, man, that guy. He was like a, he was very modeled himself after like a Chris Benoit type guy. Okay, right. Uh, and um, speaking of uh, WXW with the tournaments, another thing I wanted to touch on was I know you've got, um, I have quite a bit of experience with PWG in the past and with uh, Battle of Los Angeles 2022 coming up is that something you'd be looking to throw your name into if given the chance oh of course I mean the Battle of Los Angeles is always a very uh, special tournament there especially being out here held out here in Los Angeles yeah um, PWG is a special place it always has been you know it's a place that breeds like uh, the new talent that you'll see tomorrow that will one day when they go on and do something like they're like, oh yeah, like this is one of the places they got their first big break. Mm-hmm. I remember doing my first Battle of Los Angeles tournament in 2010. And it was just like that. I remember like the locker room was, you know, me and Generico, Kevin Steen's there, William Mack, you know, all these guys that you look at today who are, you know, the stars of today's wrestling scene, like being at the top there in PWG or just getting their breakout in the independent scene through PWG. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I remember I also, uh, was it Claudio Castagnoli had this uh, guy he wanted to bring in. He's like, this kid's a great worker. He's going to really do something he wanted. And him and Chris Hero were trying to get him into PWG so he could help get his name bigger. And it was Ricochet. Right. And then like he, he brought him in, he brought in Ricochet. And from that point on, he just, he blew up. I remember and yeah, Ricochet became a star. Yeah, I, I remember it, it happened kind of overnight for Ricochet because I used to watch him a lot in Chikara with 
him and Chuck Taylor used to put on some absolute classics together. Um, they both looked very different at the time. Ricochet with his long hair. Um, mm. and, you know, he's he, quite a young looking guy. And then it's like overnight, he became this ripped, you know, <laughs> head high flyer that everybody knew. And I think it was a lot of it was attributed to his work in PWG. Um, yeah. So, like you said, PWG has always been that place where, like, the future stars have gone first, and Battle of Los Angeles has been a way of like exposing them to the wider audience. You know, making the mark in PWG and on the independents. Battle of Los Angeles is a prestigious tournament, so I was thinking it would be cool to see you go back there and show. Like, oh, I love it. Yeah, I'd really like to see what you do with <laughs> some of the guys in PWG now. Yeah, I've watched a couple of their shows and they've just been fantastic. But um, mm-hmm. an interesting kind of. I know we touched on WXW and the shoot style there and um, you went to NXT and it was very promising. Like a lot of the, like the Tim Thatcher stuff, I remember the vignettes that you were involved in a couple of those matches with him and Champa around that storyline. And then you had Malcolm Bivens and the diamond mind just seemed like that kind of shoot style around time. We had like Finn Balor and Kyle O'Reilly in that match where they like didn't leave the ring and it was like a classic, a takeover. And they, they were like really putting, putting work into this kind of, shoot style that you see kind of elsewhere that must have been very promising for you and when did that kind of you know was there a switch that happened or was it just kind of a was there a creative like the creative just kind of go away from that kind of harder style into what we see now i'm not sure really what the uh change would be to happen uh, but as far as the diamond mind forming you know that was always originally the plan when i first came in uh well the first thing they told me when they started using me on tv right away I said, hey, we're going to make a group of like, uh, you know, shooter real type wrestlers. And, you know, it's going to be, it was originally supposed to be, you know, like uh, me and Bivens. And they were tossing around the idea of maybe having Thatcher with us. Uh, Arturo Ruas, you know, was another idea they were thinking about putting him with us. And it had changed over the course of the next few months. But everything me and Bivens were doing originally, they kept saying, no, the idea is we're going to transform you to into uh, the start of a whole new group of like these shooter type wrestlers. And then they gave us a little hiatus break because the plan was be- it become for Roderick Strong to join. And so Roddy needed a little break from TV to kind of switch gears and come back as a whole new person again. So when that happened, we all kind of like took a little TV break to re-debut all over again, to have it be like me and Roddy and Hideki Suzuki, who is another amazing knowledge of catch wrestling himself learning it straight from billy robinson so working with those guys man like that was that was yeah uh me and roddy actually started training a lot like together you know like one-on-one just to get ready for the group and to get like better with each other and to him for him to better me in general as well to see hey like we're gonna do these high profile matches in nxt like this is what you should expect more of and so we get a lot of one-on-one work, me and Roddy, just to kind of feel like a team. Mm. So when we did debut, it really did feel real. Like we really were, you know, a training team together. And Eki was evolved as far as like always helping give us advice as far as technique and everything. So what we really were, was I mind, we tried to make it as real as possible behind the scenes to really be a good community formation. Yeah, like an MMA gym training for like a, an upcoming event, like in the, in the UFC, you see like they're, teams and stuff and yeah uh, it, 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 it was I, I just love that kind of style because i'm an mma fan i just thought it was they had lightning in a bottle with it and I, hopefully they go ahead and and keep up keep, keep pushing forward with what they have now but it was it was fantastic to see that kind of the tim thatcher stuff as well i really enjoyed it. it it was refreshing to see something like that where it's presented as like you said uh like catches catch can wrestling it can be done mm-hmm. very well even in wwe and they're proving that with diamond mine and i liked when you were all working together, you, like uh, Rian said, you were like a, a gym. You know, you could tell that you guys trained together and you'd be there for each of his matches. You'd come in the ring at the end and all celebrate together. And it just seemed very legitimate, which is what I like to see in wrestling. Um, do you feel like uh, with Diamond Mine, that's something that they could take to the main roster, for example? Because I feel like it's got a, that anybody can enjoy Catch as Catch Can wrestling. Um, some people say it wouldn't resonate with like a mainstream audience, but I really do think it would. Do you think it would work no, on I think it would. roster? Yeah, I think it definitely would, especially uh, the formation that they have there right now. Yeah, I mean, if you just did catch as catch, you know, style wrestling, 
Um, that can work anywhere as long as as long as the guy is doing it or actually uh, experienced enough to understand how to keep entertaining with the crowd. I believe mm. um, that's the only turning point. Is it's great to know all the holds, but now you have to know how to kind of do it in a professional wrestling format. Right. Uh, that's a different style. But the guys that they currently have in the Diamond Mine, you know, Ivy Nile, the uh, Casper brothers, there. They're all tremendous athletes, and I think if they went to the main roster with the Diamond Mine gimmick, then it would be very, very over because they're absolutely incredible uh, amateur wrestlers. Like some of the best I've ever had. I rolled around with uh, Casper, uh, Jacob Jacob Casper. Um, I'm trying to think of his NXT name. I apologize. Brutus Creed uh, or Julius Creed? Brutus Creed. Yes, Brutus yeah. Creed. Yeah, I think you know, Julius Creed. There we go. So Julius Creed, we rolled around a good bit uh, in the back, always just, you know, little um, no-gi style rolling, you know, submission wrestling. And it, he's very, very hard to contain and control. He's so amazing out on the mat. So those guys are two legit dudes, man. They're very, very good. Yeah, I don't want to jump the gun, but um, I, I heard an interview with a certain American dragon where he was talking about kind of stables of, legitimate wrestlers and you have the AEW you can see on with Danielson's run at the moment where um he's bringing that catches can style you have Lee Moriarty you've got Danny Garcia putting on I know you've had matches with Danny Garcia in the past just putting on amazing matches with Eddie Kingston and Danielson talked about having like a stable of his own guys and obviously you have Gresham out there um what's the kind of landscape in the kind of pure division outside ring of honor do you that do you look at AEW because I'm assuming you're a wrestling fan as well and see all these names and just think dream matches in your head all the time and dream and stables even if Danielson is I'd say you throw your name in the hat for that any day of the week if, if Danielson came looking for a stable of pure wrestling. Oh Danielson was uh like so I was training a lot with uh TJ Perkins, Rocky Romero, Ricky Reyes, right? And they're doing the Sanoki Dojo style training. It's a very different form of professional wrestling teaching. Uh but that's also where Danielson learned a great portion of everything he does as well from there he learned you know from the uh new japan dojo the inoki dojo out there in santa monica he did a lot of training over there as well and so everything they were teaching me you know tj rocky and reyes i was watching danielson do that exact same techniques on like the top tier indie platforms and it was incredible to see okay this is how it would work as you're laying it into an actual professional wrestling format into a match he's doing the exact same moves they're showing me the exact same techniques in some of like the high, most high profile indie matches at that time, you know, we're talking like 2005, six, seven, you know, 2008. And so I looked up to Danielson a lot uh, before, you know, when I was younger growing up, kind of getting my own feet stable in this wrestling world. He was definitely a guy that inspired me to really push myself to be better at this and to kind of dive more into, you know, the technical style of wrestling. And any form I could work with the guy, whether it be wrestling him or, I mean, if he does a stable of people, you know, any form of that, it's honestly just a very surreal thing. I'd love to do it. I think that would be cool to see. Like, I, I, I know it's like jumping the gun, like Rian said, but a team of um, Lee Moriarty, Danny Garcia, Daniel, uh, Brian Danielson and yourself. I mean, that's like a, a dream catch stable right there. And I think that would just be really cool to see. There's some dream matches straight away for yourself in AEW. And I know it's such a cliche thing to say, like we try and avoid the question of, so do you want to go to AEW? Because surely you're just going to go wherever the work's good or where you're offered. Um, yeah. I'm guessing that would be somewhere in your mind, you're thinking of all these dream matches in AEW and what they could be. Yeah, I mean, uh, dream matches as far as they're like, I mean, Daniel Garcia has been tearing it up all over the independent scene. I've been seeing... And we wrestled, but we really wrestled, wrestled in the NXT thing. Uh, we had a match there on NXT, and, you know, I would love to be able to revisit that, but have, like, a much more, you know, more time and an actual more even keel style between the two of us. You know, I've uh, done a tag team match with them before when I came back to the independence, um, but we never really got to wrestle too much one-on-one, -on -one, so I would love to be able to revisit that with him. You know, great talent. Um there's some guys out here on the West Coast that are like tearing it up big. I'd love to be able to revisit with them. Like Adrian Quest mm. is a guy from New Japan Strong. It's a, you know, good, known him for a long time. And I'd love to be able to kind of touch back, back on the mat with him again. So I think um, New Japan Strong, 
for me of the pandemic especially has been quite a like strong point of wrestling like it's it's been so entertaining same with ring of honor actually i think ring ring of mm. honor did a great job especially considering the lack of crowd uh, they did a great job of the reinventing the product and making it seem very legit sports based and that's what new japan strong feels like as well uh, for someone like you who loves to catch wrestling legit wrestling uh, what's your experience been like with new japan strong so far uh, when I first started doing the strong tapings, we did them uh, right before I got signed with WWE. Mm. And, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of attention on them just yet as far as, like, nobody really knew what we were even doing. It was kind of kept quiet the first few tapings, I think, actually, uh, until they started airing on TV, just because it also was a pandemic time and we weren't sure, like, if this was going to work or how it was going to take off. After I got signed, it took off, like, really big. I was noticing all over because there wasn't a whole lot going on in the wrestling world. And this is Japan for wrestling for one. And it's also, you know, American guys getting more exposure on their mats. So those two combinations really, really blew it off big. Uh, great additions like Tom Lawler and Fred Rosser, obviously like, you know, Brody King having great matches. They're bringing in new Japan guys like Kenta and stuff and you know, Jay White to come in and, you know, help, get us some more on with the actual Japanese style from New Japan. Um, the way it took off while I was signed, it was incredible to see. So getting released and getting back with them now, it's, you know, great to be able to come back and actually have something more to offer them. Before it was like, hey, like, you know, I'm the guy that's a really good talent. I've got like a little name, but not a big one. You know, some people know who I am, some people don't. It's, I don't know. But now at least it's like, hey, here's a guy that, you know, I, I have a name now. Mm -hmm. I have something to offer you outside of just good wrestling talent and ability. Now I actually have some kind of value and, you know, a little bit of status to be able to offer to New Japan Strong and make this thing even stronger. Pun not intended, but there it is. <laughs> yeah, Callum made a strong pun earlier and then we got a... Then we got a <laughs> we got but uh, but um, it's really, really cool and it must be great for you to see kind of um, someone from um, Callum's neck of the woods, kind of Gabriel Kidd, getting a chance against Eddie Kingston and, um, at the next New Japan pay, New Japan Strong pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. And then you've got people like Claire Connors and um, Fredericks, and you've just got all these young talent just getting... You see Shota Umino over in, in the UK, fighting on UK shows. It just must be great for you to... Um, it's a blessing in disguise that you come out of this kind of con uh, this unfortunate situation where you see that there's so many opportunities for, like, everybody it must just it must must have just lit a fire under you seeing all these people just getting so many big opportunities on big shows oh yeah it definitely does i mean especially when it comes through new japan because that's based out of california mm. so these are a lot of guys i know that are uh it gives a lot of opportunity to west coast guys as well and that's always been kind of a hard point i think within the wrestling uh independent wrestling world is breaking out of the west coast is a, a very hard thing you know, it's part of the reason why it took me so long to get signed myself because it was like, well, you're great, but you don't have a name value because throughout the West, you know, there's not really much going on there. It kind of gives you that. So New Japan's strong success is also a big platform for a lot of undiscovered or to be rediscovered West Coast talent. Guys like Bad Dude Tito, I think are going to be on the next one. He's another incredible guy to see in the ring. You know, because Adrian Quest, uh, Clark Connors was a guy from Seattle that didn't really have, he had a bunch of talent. And now he's getting great exposure with them because, you know, they're training through Shibata's dojo. Uh, Carl Fredericks is another guy that was, you know, yeah. West Coast guy that this door opened up for him out here and it took off very, very, very well for him. So it's a great thing to see for the giant platform that's giving to a lot of, you know, really good brothers out here on the West Coast. Yeah, there's there's some great talent in uh, on the strong roster. Uh, Carl Fredericks definitely is somebody who I think has a very bright future. Uh, we've spoken to him before, and he just seems like such a switched on guy, very focused. I, I see big things for him. But somebody else, <laughs> Gabriel Kidd, uh, he's a UK kid, you know. He's yeah, UK guy. Really proud is a is a strong lad. Um, that's somebody who I think has a very bright future too. Uh, have you had oh, yeah. to train with him or uh, grapple with him yet? I uh, just met. We met at the last strong tapings that uh, we did out here in Riverside. So I'll see him again this week. We're doing another New Japan strong set, you know, over in Los Angeles. Uh, I'll see him again there. 
But unfortunately, I've never actually been able to tie up or work on the map much with Gabriel Kidd yet. I've always heard very, very good things about him, actually. Yeah, yeah. He's been incredible. Uh, and the one thing that I just hold him to, a gr- like, anytime someone goes out, I, I, he went out on New Japan and talked about his mental health and about the struggles over the last couple of months. Um, that's, that's another thing I admire in, 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 re- in wrestlers or celebrities when they come out and just talk about their mental health openly, especially during the pandemic. Um, is, have you got any any thoughts on like obviously we were going through this pandemic with like wrestling and stuff? It's very hard to kind of keep your keep your head above the water at the best of times. Is is there anything you have in, um like advice or kind of like, like your own your own um struggles with mental health issues? Yeah, mental health has been a very very real realization I think for everybody kind of as the last few years have gone. Mm. Um, I mean it's always been there, but it's just the kind of thing that we've always slept under the rug. I think. So it's very nice to see just how much we're taking notice of the society of, hey, the impact of it's not just physical damage. It's just, you know, it's it's it, it takes a toll on your mind. It takes a toll on your energy. It takes a toll inside of you. And when the pandemic hit, it was a giant reset, I think, for like everybody. Right. Like whether your momentum was hot or whether it was just kind of milding out, everybody had to stop and start the exact same point once it was starting back over again and i know it really hit a lot of people hard as far as their mental health goes because well this is going to be leading to maybe a little bit of depression because now all of a sudden you're being stagnant and yeah. when you're not when you're not when you're not uh consuming yourself with the successes that you were getting anymore now you may feel you're starting to fall behind now you may feel you're starting to you've lost whatever momentum you had i know i was worried about that but i was really really you know active and feeling very uh, hot in the scene right before the pandemic hit. And I was very heavily concerned that uh, once it started back up, that me being 33 years old, you know, uh, it's going to be very hard for a 33 year old guy to kind of get back to being hot again, man. Like that may have been my shot and that may have been gone. Luckily that wasn't the case. You know, New Japan was there for me right away. ROH was there. And then WWE came knocking on my door all within like six months. So I was very, very fortunate in that aspect for the timing rise. Um, I know a lot of guys that are very, very good talents, they were not as fortunate. And it's been still a struggle to get their names back to being, you know, to being a standard. One gentleman that I can think of, uh, Andy Brown, who was, you know, working pro wrestling gorilla and getting very, very uh, hot and a lot of attention on the independent scene. But post the pandemic has kind of had that struggle as far as, hey, getting that, that footing back going again. Yeah. And, you know, there's guys like him all over, but it's just, it, it's, it, it, it sucks. And these are the cards that lay in front of us, but life is a lot of changes and uh, ups and downs, peaks and valleys. You know, it's just about taking them all as they come one at a time, you know. I mean, we've all been sorry. We've all been hurt, but it's how we survive. It makes us who we are, right? Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself, really. Like I said, everyone has it's mental health has always been a thing, and especially in wrestling. And, you know, after a release, for example, you do have those doubts and concerns. But it's fantastic to see that you have been able to thrive and you are doing great work. I, I'm genuinely excited for your future. <laughs> and I'm sure you are, too. Um, it's why I mentioned the Battle of Los Angeles, because when I was thinking about where I'd like to see you next as a fan, PWG was the, one of the places that stood out to me. You know, that's where I'd like to see you go. Um, but I think, I'm sure wherever you do go, you go into, I, I'm not trying to make a pun here, you're going to make an impact. Um, there's so many things you can say, you know, and it just sounds like you're trying to allude to something, even though impact would probably be great for you too. There's too, um, too many companies. There's just too many, <laughs> there's too many companies. <laughs> They're all fun. <laughs> um, but before we start to wrap up, um, obviously, really appreciate your time and speaking with us hopefully get to do it again down the line and see where you did end up going if you did do the battle of los angeles um if you're a champion in strong for example or did ring of honor come back that all these questions so let's do it again down the line until then um where can we find you do you have any merchandise that you want to plug I'm like the worst guy in merchandise and social media, brother. I apologize about that. But I mean, like oh, I have the Instagram and Twitter stuff, you know, just underscore Taylor Rust. It's there. You can follow it. 
um i'm just <laughs> i'm the worst guy when it comes to showing merchandise and whatnot honestly that is fine with us sometimes we say do you have any social media or merchandise and it takes up about five minutes of the show so you're just like mm. yeah you can find me on twitter and instagram that's fine <laughs> <laughs> but um, like i said thank you so much for joining us and all the best with everything that's coming your way in 2022 yeah all the best appreciate, appreciate you guys very much have a great one thank you Bye.